before I introduce uh, Christian Groskopf, the presenter, I would just like to say a few things to introduce the ICCP to anyone uh, who hasn't attended one of our webinars before. All right, so who are we? The Institute of Construction Claims Practitioners. Um, we are an institute to recognize the skills, qualifications, and expertise in the professional management of construction claims. So our three main objectives are to establish international professional standards, to give recognition for those who have gained the appropriate knowledge and skills uh, in the management of claims, and also to educate those who wish to gain that knowledge and those skills. Okay, so why is there a need for the ICCP when there are so many uh, construction industry organizations? Well, quite simply, none of those organizations focus exclusively on construction claims. It is a, a rather specialized area and we would like to recognize the people who have gained that knowledge. Okay, so I would just introduce very quickly our steering committee. We have our executive officer, Andy Hewitt, which if you have attended our previous webinars, you have probably seen one that he has presented. Also our president, Paul Gibbons, today's presenter, Christian Groskopf, Lee Sporl, and Mark Watson. Uh, Nina Hewitt is our general manager and I am currently taking her place temporarily while she is on maternity leave. Okay, so how can you become a member? Uh, we have three levels, associate member and fellow. I won't go into the specifics, but as with most other organizations, each of those levels has uh, different um, qualifications and uh, skills and expertise that are necessary to join at those levels. Okay, we also have a corporate membership for corporations that, would, that have claims departments or consultancies that focus exclusively on claims. And why should you join? Well, we have, first of all, we keep a library of knowledge, which are articles, case studies, et cetera, related to contracts and claims, and those grow on a monthly basis. And we have uh, what I think is probably one of the best benefits is our library of templates, which are for members to download and use in their own claims, both to standardize their claims and also to save them time. Of course, that's what templates are best for. We also have uh, regular CPD webinars. So for example, our members who attend today will receive a CPD hour certificate. Okay, we also offer further uh, training savings. We have a training partner claims class and we do offer a 10% discount on training programs that members take through claims class, as well as 25% and 15% from uh, two major publishers. And we have a monthly newsletter. I need to update that. It says quarterly. It is actually monthly. And I uh, send out a roundup of all of the latest things that have happened in the ICCP over the course of the month. Okay. And of course, our softer benefits, industry exposure. We do have a public listing of members so that it is quite easy for you know, potential employers, et cetera, to check a membership. You do receive a certificate of membership showing your designation, as well as a logo that you can use in your CV, your LinkedIn profile, et cetera, wherever you would like to show your membership. Okay, and we also have a register of claims practitioners, which is an optional benefit. And each of the claims practitioners do receive a, a web page profile on the ICCP website so that uh, third parties who would like professional advice on their claims can contact them directly. Okay, so if you have any questions, I realize I went through that pretty quickly. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I have used the wrong uh, slide here. Uh, contact me, so if you just go to membership at instituteccp.com, I can answer any of your questions. Okay, and with that, 
I'm going to hand things over to Christian. Uh, he is, as I said, he is one of our steering committee members. He is also on our register of claims practitioners. He has uh, a long and illustrious career in claims, and he is here today to talk to you about quantifying disruptions, which I believe is quite a timely topic. So Christian, take it away, please. Jen, thank you very much. If we've got currently about 30 people in the um, webinar as it is now, and I hope it will be a, quite a positive and a learning experience. And I hope you will take away some very interesting and workable information on that. Jen can see the people and if you need, as she said, Q&A questions, please just drop them there and we will definitely do as many of them as possible towards the end. All right, let's just find out who are we talking about. Um, Jen has told you who I am. And Jen, if you would be so kind as to launch the first poll, because I'm also interested to see, and I think every one of us are interested to see who are in the, who are in the, um, who are listening in and who will be part of our discussion today. And then we can continue further. Okay, what? so yes, the attendees can see them now and they are answering. So I'll give them about 30 more seconds and then we can look at the answers. Yeah. While you are doing those questions, let's have a look at what is the problem statement. We know contractors are frequently disrupted, but how do you substantiate this cost? That's not the easy one. And we know all that to, to substantiate disruptions is a challenge and a half. So we know disruptions due to COVID, well, no, disruptions due to COVID is a prime example. Direct costs are relatively easy to substantiate and quantify. If the works were stopped, also relatively easy to substantiate and quantify. But what if, what if you have got disruptions? Now that's interesting to look at the results um, that came I out. Think got, I I think I messed that up there. Um, hold no, on. That's all right. No problem. I'll stop sharing the screen. All right. So um, if you look at the results, um, I'll let you discuss them. Can you see them, Christian? I can, yes. Okay. So it's interesting to have uh, quite a, a, a decent spread of client developers, engineers, and contractors with a little bit more weight on the contractors. So... I actually expected that there will be a, a, um, a bit more contractors than the other parts, but I am pleasantly surprised to see the interest of the engineers and the client as well. Um, good spread between legal and engineering. Um, and then finally, um, it's interesting, a close on 50-50 split between ICCP members and non-members. So we'll leave that for a second or two more so that we understand who are the people that are sharing our time here. And I will try and also adapt the discussion according to that. All right. I think we can um, drop that, Jen. And if you would be so kind as to put us the screen back on there. Yes, I will as soon as I figure out, I seem to have lost my, um, sorry, I seem to have lost my options. But, oh, there we go. Back, back in it. <laughs> sorry, all my right. computer is being very slow today. There we go. Okay. That's all right. No problem. All right, if you can jump towards the problem statement, introductions we've done, problem statement. All right, so we said, um, disruptions, 
common in construction. Also common is the challenges that faces us to prove that. And how do we show this influence and how can we Con, number one, convince the engineer, but also on the other end, Mr. Engineer, what do you want to see when you see a, a disruption claim? So next slide, please. And the next one. So the, what we're going to touch on today, um, and you can run there off one, two, three, four, five points Jen, the last one is Q&A. So we're gonna, we've touched on the problem. Then we will look at some of the challenges that we face. There are a number of possible solutions in the industry. And I want to discuss specifically more in detail on the construction leadership group, the CLC in the UK and their COVID toolkit and how this actually makes our life much easier when it comes to generally disruptions and specifically global disruptions. And then finally, we will open the floor to questions. Next slide, please. All right, we started talking about the challenge and the main challenge is uh, just, okay, that's fine, just leave it there. Um, so what other challenges do we face? First of all, remember, as the contractor, the challenge is there for you to prove the case. The basic thing says, he who alleges must prove. Fortunately, not beyond reasonable doubt, like it is in civil cases, but just what we call a, a preponderance of the evidence. So basically, what you put in front of the engineer must seem reasonable. You you've got to be 50, 51% accurate in or um, reasonable that you are entitled to such a claim rather than not. And I would like the engineers also to take this at heart. I am a contractor doesn't need to prove his case beyond reasonable doubt. And if you go to an employer to defend the award of a claim, remember, Mr. Clients and developers, the rule is it just has to be within, as we say, a preponderance of um, evidence. So if there's a better chance of him being entitled to this claim, they're not entitled to this claim. According to the legal uh, requirements, generally, you need to look at his, um, at his claim. And in, most, in the cases then to accept the ruling of the engineer. Another big challenge we have is the willingness to find solutions and to be reasonable. It's easy to find fault. It's so easy to find fault and to pull something apart. But although the contract doesn't say this, just in your mind, what is the right thing to do? Has the guy had the cost? Has it been disrupted? Should we consider this? Yes or no? Remember, um, there's always a chance to find fault. When we come to specifically to uh, disruption claims, usually you need to measure the actual or current situation against something to show the quantum of the disruption. So on your screen currently there, you've got a list of items which the Society of Construction Law has published as potential, um, as potential measurements, measuring sticks. And if you would be so kind as just to share with us through the next poll, what are your experiences with these different, different um, methods? Um, 
Jen, if you can just um, issue the poll. I'm not going to ask you to, I'm not going to go and give a breakdown of each and every one of these. The SEL has got a protocol which is freely available on the web, and they explain the different ways. But it would be interesting to see how many of you have actually heard of some of these before, and which of actually which of these methods you've been using. So we're giving you a few uh, a few seconds to just go through the list. It's quite a long list, um, but it shows you the different industry accepted ways of showing and analyzing disruptions. Jen, you can see what is the um, progress on the poll. And if you see it is tapering off, please be so kind as just to give us the results. We've still got people answering. So I'm going to give about 15 more seconds, I think. Oh, more than, that's fine. Uh, this is not a long, tedious webinar, so we have got time to play. Um, so if we give them a few more um, seconds, that's fine. It's been um, about five seconds since anybody has answered anything. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And okay. let's look at the results. Yeah, I was expecting that measured mile is going to be the the highest, um, um, and then programming or system dynamics modeling, I see is also taking a big, uh, a bigger score. So if we look at which of the following have you used, uh, measured mile, 50% of the guys said they have used that, earned value analysis, program analysis, which you usually do, work or training. Uh, yes, that I expect to be, um, quite low. Estimate versus incurred labor. That is also quite an interesting one. Um, estimate versus used cost. Um, all right. I wasn't expecting that to be one of the favorite, or not one of the favorites, but being used that much. But if that is the case, then so, it, so be it. All right, then which of the following have you heard of, but not used? Um, I expected actually that measured mile would have been higher. Um, but no, if you look at the 50-50, that makes it that just about everyone had, uh, had heard of measured mile. Between, between the 16 plus 12 out of the 28 which voted, that basically said everyone know about measured mile. That gives you an idea of what is in the industry there. All right, let's close this and then let's go to the next slide. The CLC, uh, Construction Leadership Council, um, early in the COVID issued a uh, prepared and issued what they call the COVID-19 cost assessment toolkit. And this is again downloadable from, the web, from their website. It's also a free download. And the purpose for that was really a methodology for assessing and reporting the cost implications of post-COVID working conditions in the construction industry. Uh, that was published in July, 2020. Next slide, please, Jen. Now, that is, that is a very interesting document. Um, and I, I've been using this in some of the claims already. Um, so why should we use the toolkit? Next slide, please, Jen. And the next one. And the next one, yeah. So why should we use it? It has been put together by a known and respected construction institution. So it will be considered as an industry accepted and or vetted way of doing it. But it's also interesting that um, RICS has 
gave us given this a vote of confidence by adopting the approach in some of their tender calculations. Now, the areas that we are specifically interested in for today's discussion is tools one and two, which are number one, productivity measure toolkit, and an estimate, an estimate adjustment. Next slide, please. Now, really what we do is, it's nothing new. It is just a way how to make our life easier and that you don't have to have this massive discussions on is it reasonable or is it not reasonable? Um, did you do the calculations correct or did it, didn't you do the calculations correct? And I would strongly recommend even the engineers to, when they know that this claim is coming, is recommend to the contractor, use this. And it actually gives you a complete breakdown of how to use it. So we're not gonna go into the detail of each and everything, um, but we are going to give you the basics. All right, so we said the principle on most of these things, you need to establish a baseline. And then we look at the solutions. All right, so there is your baseline in that case. Um, Jen, if you could click um, new, next slide, please. Okay, so if you I'll go back, previous one. All right, so you have got initially that first part, which is in this case, which we're looking at COVID, the pre-COVID period. Um, then as in the UK, December, January, a lot of influences over Christmas. So you can't consider that as reasonable. And then according to their statement, uh, potential shutdown period and restart. And then you were running COVID conditions on your site round about May. This is what the examples show you. So you've got a definite step from the baseline, September, November, and February, and compared to the current. So the current May to July is then measured against the September, November baseline. But that doesn't always have to be these dates, but that gives you an example of, or, or gives you the idea of one against the other, the actual versus the baseline. Next slide, please. Then what the toolkit has done, it gives you, it gives you all, the, all the information on how to do it, but you fill in a simple one page data for each month. And it gives you the, plan, the, the monthly planned revenue. I grayed out some of these things because I took it out of a, a claim that I was doing for a contractor. Um, so that was why the, some of the values are grayed out. Um, and a monthly play, if you've got there, 1A planned versus actual revenue, your monthly planned revenue and the monthly actual revenue. And that then works out a factor. It's the same with the workforce indicator, total actual number of workers on site in the month. Now, when you say total number of workers on site, what they talk about here is how many people went through the turnstiles, if you've got turnstiles and then they're actually working in the reporting month. And that's how many people went through the turnstiles for the month, how many workers has gone through. So if you've got a thousand workers on site working 28 days, that figure should be around about 28,000. All right, um, next slide, if you please, Jen. And then the rest of the, the page is the output indicators, the actual revenue and that is compared to the number of workers on site, um, productivity indicators, which is calculated, um, and the preliminary total project costs, which are also uh, to be put in. Now, if you look at the template on the website, one of these references are wrong. I can't remember which one, 1A, one 1B. One, one of them are wrong. The, the formula is correct, but just the, uh, the reference is, 
is wrong. One says 1B when it was to be 1A or some, something minor accordingly. So that is what you have to put together and you put that in on a monthly basis. Next slide, please. That then allows you to calculate your, or, or that, that just summarizes the next, uh, the, what you see there is then the summary of this information that has been calculated. Now, if you look at the template and the graph that we showed, it was a basically a break between um, you had you had um, October, November as baseline, October, November, and February as baseline, and then May, June as the influences. Now, for our situation, I broke it between March and April because we worked in a non non Christmas following um, country, and the influence we really started feeling was um, in April. So I, I made the distinction between, um, between March and April. All right, so Jen, if you can give us the next one. So coming back to this, what we've done in our case, next slide, please. In our case, no Christmas, and no shutdown. We're continued all the time through, but at a reduced rate. So that is why I broke it down in the way that I showed you in the previous slide. All right, next slide. That is where we had our break is between March and between March and April. All right, next one. I then just used the average of the last three months as my baseline, and I then evaluated the different next months compared to my three months average. Now people can say to you, yeah, but your calculations may be wrong. True, but that mistake that you make in your baseline, you make the same mistake in your monthly progress or your, your monthly figures. So you are comparing apples with apples. Your apples may be a little bit off, but you're still comparing the same off apples with the same off apples. So the indicators are valid. Next slide, please. I then use the plan versus actual revenue and the output indicator of revenue to show that we did not fully function. And the output, the, that shows you the under recovery of overheads and support services, which are usually covered in your markup. So that is the first item that you have got as a support for adjustment in rates. So under recovery of support services, and if you know what, usually you have got at least a breakdown on your rates. So you can apply this, in this case, um, for 20% on the top one under recovery, and 10%, this shows 10%, on the second line as under recovery. So there you're quantifying already the influence of the disruption. Next slide, please. And then finally, the productivity indicator tells you just how many, how much less productive your operations were. And you should be able to say to the engineer and the engineer should be comfortable to accept to say that my IPC, the measured items, um, the costs were 10% were more than, than, uh, than what is the, rev the expected revenue. So this gives you a very quick, simple and robust way 
to quantify the disruption. All right, should you only use this for COVID? Actually, no. Um, let's say you've got a early start disruption. Um, Jenny, if you could go to the next slide, please. You've got an early start disruption and then later things come right and you have got then a good running. You can use exactly the same principle as we've done with the COVID example. Next slide, please. And you can then go and say, Mr. Engineer, there is what I have been disrupted. This is how I've been disrupted. And the engineer can run similar calculations and said, Mr. Contractor, you are really um, not playing the game here. This is what your figures show you are um, being disrupted. And this you can use right through the life of the project. You can have a phase where you've been disrupted and then you've got a front, a disruption phase and afterwards, and you can use it exactly in the same way. So a very simple, robust, industry approved and accepted method which you can use. And that basically is the whole message I want to share with you today. So, Jen, if you go to the next slide, let's have a look at questions. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop sharing the screen. And I saw that uh, Francisco had his hand up. So I'm going to see if, yeah. So Francisco, I have uh, asked you to unmute. So you should be able to ask your question. I think. Well, that, let's see, that may not have worked. Well, in the meantime, Graham Hooley has a question. He asks, what is the procedure when the information cannot be trusted? Graham, interesting question. Um, the engineer should at least have a, a reasonable level of information. He should know how many people have been on the site during and afterwards. Now, if that level of accuracy or um, lack of accuracy is the same for the disruption period and the non-disruption period, then we're fine. Remember, all we're interested in is to look at the difference, not at the accuracy. Okay. So, that, 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 will, that is basically the, the beauty of this. Um, the accuracy is not that important as long as you have got a similar accuracy. Okay. All right. Um, our next question is from Alistair who asks, what supporting information would a contractor need to provide? If the figures presented are inflated by the contractor or claimed to be inflated? Alistair, this, if you go and look through the, um, at the guidelines, your main source of information is labor or, or people on site and costs. So what you can do is you can ask for the, the I'm not sure if you're a contractor or if you're an engineer, but the best way to prove or to, yeah, to prove the, the labor 
is get hold of the payment schedules or the um, or the the timesheets um, or the summary of the timesheets. Every contractor has got that, so he should be able to either give it or ask for it. So don't. That is the one thing. If he tries to, if anyone tries to fudge the figures. They're not going to fudge the figures of the timesheets because that is going to cost them more money for payment out. So that is the one item which you've got, which is fairly um, a fixed and a way how you, how you can't really mess around with it. And the other one, we're using IPCs. The guy has claimed his IPC. You've gone through the IPC or the engineer has gone through the IPC or you have produced the figures, they are again comparing the before and the after and the approach of the IPC tends to be constant. It's not that you're now bringing in new information, it's information that's already in on record. Okay, and it looks like he has a follow-up question. Sure. What what about contractor inefficiencies? Uh, labor numbers may not reflect this. Say more labor, uh, but no plant for those operatives to work. Um, again, we look at what was the amount of labor we had before, or yeah, before during the during the uh, measurement period, and how much does he have? Does, how much does he have here? during the COVID period. The chances of him to come and say to you, oh, I had 20% more people during COVID, that defeats anything. And he, as he is also supposed to mitigate his, his, his um, risks. So you can expect that he will not come up with something like that. Okay. And Graham asks, how about the situation when earned value cannot be calculated because the project is using milestone payments? Um, yeah, good challenging question, that one. <laughs> um, again, I would suggest is look at the, the form. The form gives a monetary input for work done. You can, on the same way, use a percentage of progress um, as the measurement item. So even with that, hopefully you can look at that. Okay, and then I think a follow-up from Graham. How if the contractor is already in delay of his own when COVID hits the site? <laughs> now you're opening a totally um, Pandora's box. Um, number one is, is there, uh, there are two situations here. Number one is, did his own delay cause him to go into COVID? That's, that's a total different question. But if he would have had COVID, even though um, he, if he was going to be influenced by COVID, if his delay was not that severe that he would have missed the COVID period, then you still go back and look for a period where he actually did his work properly or just before the COVID period, that was his baseline. This is his production. Now compare that with the COVID period. So your measurement stick is a period just before COVID. And if he was delaying himself there, then he must show that he was delayed more during the COVID period. If he doesn't have that, then um, he's shooting himself in the foot. Okay, and he says, thank you. Uh, Edwin asks, what would be the best means of claiming for idle plant or equipment? Um, idle plant equipment is part of your direct costs. Um, that is something which is not a disruption claim. Idle plant and equipment, that's a standing time claim. 
That's a much easier approach to doing. This is not addressed in this method. That is a separate claim. Any, let's say any prolongation cost or um, extension of time cost um, usually have looking at, uh, prolongation costs usually look at uh, non-production stuff and standing time looks at standing time claims. The challenge in the industry, and this is what we're trying to disrupt, uh, address here, is where you have got a disruption. The plant is not idle or is partly idle or is not fully occupied. In this situation, your production will show lesser, lesser output. And that is supposed also to address on the, um, the cost of the plant. But you may have situations where you have got plants standing for whatever reason. Um, for instance, you didn't have the people to, to do the work. Um, that is part of a idle time or a standing time or a stoppage of certain sections or the whole period of the work's done. Okay, and John asks, can you give us some tips how to convince the engineer to use the CLC toolkit rather than the prescribed disruption procedure as per the contract? Um, let's face it. <laughs> COVID is a absolutely unexpected event. The real way how you need to address all your COVID matters um, is enter into discussions. One of the big problems I think we're facing in construction is we do not talk with one another or people get bogged into, into their own position and they're not prepared to listen. What is this one song of Simon and Garfunkel say, say um, see without, uh, what, looking without listening, seeing and, and hearing without, listening without hearing. Um, and that we often find. And really your best approach to that is getting a neutral to try and breach that problem. And that is usually allowed through, through a DAB. And that is, that's another field, but that is something people that you really, really, really need to look at the advantage of a DIB. I know I'm going a little bit off topic here, but that is my other um, pet love is um, dispute resolutions or actually dispute avoidance, which um, you can address by getting a dispute board, which concentrate on avoidance as part of your construction. Um, what is interesting is that FIDIC now in the new 2017 insist on DIBs on all their projects. And those has to be in place before commencement of the project. Consider that. Um, I'm sure that um, Jen can also give you my contact details or, uh, towards the end. And you're more than welcome to, to um, contact me offline and that we discuss more on the spirit boards. But um, you, you need to come up with a very good reason why you should not use the contract uh, prescribed method. Um, if your disruption is not COVID, then you will have a challenge. If your disruption is COVID, you can go with the approach of, this is really something totally new, which wasn't expected when we entered into the contract. And look, even these people think um, this is a valid way of addressing the problem. No, the CLC, uh, the question, is the CLC toolkit based on measured mile analysis? No, it's not. It's on work done before the outside of the um, disruption period and work done during the disruption period. Okay, um, yeah, just back to John, uh, I will make sure that both uh, Christian's email and the CLC toolkit are linked in uh, the slides and the slides will go up with the, uh, the replay on the website. 
Um, let's see someone, oh, you are welcome, John. <laughs> All right, and I think somebody had something in the chat. Yes, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, please, can you share the download link with us? Uh, questions one, how can you use the measured mile if your actual progress before COVID was lower than planned? And then when COVID started, your planned progress was more than planned, meaning possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So bottom line is COVID didn't interfere, didn't disrupt you. Something else disrupted you and COVID um, then kicked in. Um, Franz, what I will do in a case like that is I will fill in the forms. I will send it through as, um, as um, contemporary records. And I will wait until I get to the period where I do full production. That's exactly that last slide that I showed you. Um, there may be something else that caused the delay in the, or the disruption initially. And this is actually, that is one of the things that I experience is this. So we just quite gradually submit the, um, or I ask the contractor to submit the, the monthly progress reports. And then when we get back to full production, we will then analyze it and see where we disrupted, but also where we disrupted or to what level were we disrupted before COVID. Okay, and um, as for the link, I have put in the chat the link to the toolkit. And as I said, I'll also make sure that that is linked uh, in the slides when the slides go up for the replay. Jen, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's. I, I believe this is this is a, a, a as I said, it's a simple, robust, um, very effective way of doing that. Francisco, you wanted to ask a question. I don't think you've managed to do that. Um, if you want to, why don't you drop the question in the Q and A or in the chat if you can't unmute your your mic, and then we can try and get your answer in as well. And does anyone else have any questions? I'm not sure what is the gender distribution of the um, of the people, um, because I'm I've been taken to task a few times. In a fairly male environment, I got into the habit of saying "gents A B C D E," "gents this way and this way." So, just to make sure I do not step on toes, ladies and gents, um, I would like to thank you for your time. I hope that this. This gives you some thoughts. I hope it will take, it will roll a few stones out of your way. And the, in our initial count, there were around about half of you not being members of the ICP, ICCP. Now, these are the type of advantages that you can get. You've got access to people like me, um, like Andy, which have gone through the mill, that have seen problems, that have not seen problems only, but also have found solutions or potential ways of doing it. Um, claims are a totally misguided, um, not misguided, it's a better English word, misunderstood aspect of the contract. Um, it is supposed to be in the contract, the employer puts it in and it is supposed to be looked at. So why do people get annoyed if there are claims coming through? That is the second action to prevent disputes. The first one is to talk. The second one is to do claims. And only if that fails, you get into disputes. So. Don't consider disputes as a swear word. 
It is something that is there in the con in the contract. You are supposed, and the engine, the contractor and the engineer is supposed to follow the procedures of the claims. Use it. It is to the benefit of the project. Um, was a question on the chat. Oh, what is the difference? Asked for your email, so I've go ahead. I've went ahead and put uh, Christian's email in the chat for anyone who uh, can't wait for the presentation slides to go up on the website. And he is also on the website uh, because he is on the steering committee, and he's also one of our registered claims practitioners. There are. Uh, a few places on the website where you can find him, uh, but I have put his email there in the chat. I also saw a question that came through to say, what is the difference between prolongation claim and a disruption claim? Um, Maher, I think you understand the disruption claim. A prolongation claim is, you've got an extension of time. You have got to keep your people, if you, let uh, rephrase that, when you have got an extension of time that is awarded to you, your quantities didn't change. Your allowable for your support services didn't change just because you're given additional time. The prolongation cost is to recover the extended period that you have got to keep your person, your support staff on site. That's why it's the pro, it's prolonged. The district, the time is prolonged because of that prolonged, you've got a prolongation cost. Okay, and uh, Mar also had his hand up. So if, if you did have a follow-up question, I have uh, invited you to unmute yourself if you had something you wanted to uh, ask live. And um, I was also asked uh, if the webinar was recorded. Yes, it has been recorded. Please uh, give me a couple of days to get it up on the website, but it will be on the website. We do have a webinar page um, if you go to the ICCP website, one of the uh, options you are given at the top of the screen is resources, and one of them is webinars, and all of our public webinars are posted on the website, and they are also on our YouTube channel, but um, the YouTube channel, if you go directly to the YouTube channel, you'll then uh, need to go to the website um, to get the slides. So I will link that as well. But if you go to the website, you can download the slides directly from there. But as I say, please give me a couple of days to get that up there. Um, France, um, I'm an independent consultant. So that Gmail account is my, is my formal account. Um, I don't have a, this, that, that is my business account. Or, um, that is my work email address. So you're welcome to use that. Okay, and Franz also asks, how effective is it to use typical daily activities that have been disrupted by COVID, meaning 10 minutes here and there for waiting in line, sanitizing, et cetera. If your production cannot be measured, will this be effective? Um, yes, very much so, because that disruption causes lesser production. And that is what we're really looking here. And your production is measured in, um, in money terms or in what other terms. So again, the influence is how are you disrupted? And all these little 10 minutes um, hassles, having to use three buses because you've got to now have social distancing in your buses and it takes longer to debus and load, et cetera. All those type of things are relatively well presented in the production. At the end of the day, your claim is, what is the influence? What is your cost? If you can lose 10 minutes and you make it up, uh, 
if you lose 10 months production and you make it up because of whatever, you have not been disrupted in the biggest, in the longest sense of the word. You have not had any more costs because you made it up. So then you are not entitled to any adjustment of cost. Okay, and he also added uh, time sheets showing disruption, but I'm not sure what he means by that. Other uh, than it's just evidence, um, I guess. Yeah, the 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 time. Um, your, in your questions, how your production if your if your production cannot be measured, will this be effective? Um, your production has to be measured in some other way, um, either through money paid in the IPC or um, percentage in your progress reports. So this tends to balance out over a period. Okay, so Franz added, uh, yes, having a typical sheet with what happened during the day, typical versus affected. Um, and he further added two hours per day measured during COVID. Well, the contractor can try and use that to prove and the engineer can use the actual people on site and the IPC to check. Um, and that between the balance of those two, you should be able to find a reasonable outcome. Remember, no, nothing of these things are 100%. It's a best estimate of the disruption. Okay, well, it looks like that is all of our questions and we are coming right up on the hour. So I think that's probably a good place to end things. Christian, I'd like to thank you very much. I think you have probably uh, explained this uh, very helpfully for everyone, both who's watching live and also uh, for the replay. So thank you very much, Christian. And thank you everyone for attending today. Ladies and gents, thank you for your time. Contact the 50% who are not members of ICCP yet. Consider this. It is really um, beneficial. All right. I'm out of here. I've got another um, meet, not a meeting, another call that I have to attend to. So thank you very much for your time.